Welcome. We're going to get started. My name is Ira Chinoy. I'm one of two directors of the Future of Information Alliance. And through the magic of technology, I've got my fingers crossed, I'm going to turn you over to the other director, Alison Druin, who is in the museum. And my name is Alison Druin. Ah, yes, it works. And I am the other director of the Future of Information Alliance. And welcome, welcome to today's Futurist event. Uh, we are grateful and proud of our founding partners, and this year they will be helping us host um, some of our visiting futurist events. And this video conference is an example of, um, of, of how we're going to be hosting. Uh, with this fall event today, we are going to explore the phenomenon of MOOCs, massively open online courses. And that seems to have exploded across the country and across the world. And it seems that wants to hold great promise and uh, the likelihood of great disruption uh, in the world of higher education. Thanks, Allison. And I would now like to introduce University of Maryland President Wallace Lowe. Thank you, Ira. And hello, Allison. This is uh, remarkable. The future of information, well, the future is here now. So welcome all of you to this transformation of uh, Welcome to our distinguished panelists here and at the museum, and to all of you for coming. Now, when one talks about transformation and the future, who's making predictions is difficult, especially about the future. I don't know what MOOCs will do to the landscape of higher education, but I do know this. There are three forces that are converging in society today. Number one is political and financial at least in the public higher education sector, we can anticipate, at best, flat funding for the foreseeable future. Maybe not cuts, but certainly no significant increases. So therefore, the holy grail of public higher education has always been this. How do you increase the number of students who have access to higher education? How do you educate them better? And thirdly, how do you reduce the cost for doing so? And in the old days, it was always do more with more. We have more money, so you admit more students and increase your quality. I think those days are pretty much gone. And during, during the Great Recession and before, the mantra was, do more with less. And that doesn't quite work. Quality does cost money. And I think today with what you have. And that brings in the second major force, technology. And from what little I have seen of the technological platforms available today, they are totally different from when I last took an online course from a for-profit university about 12 years ago when I did it just out of curiosity. And it it, in those days, you basically had a talking head on the internet. Somebody went and took a video of that professor and put it on the internet. That is the equivalent. It reminds me of when TV was first invented and their notion of using television was to to film a stage play and put that stage play on television. It is a totally different platform. It is not simply replicating that live stage on a smaller screen. Just as today, online education with enormous technological opportunities of rich multimedia, of having video, and then also having algorithms that can track your every move, provide feedback, 
have online discussion groups, have crowdsourcing in terms of, of, uh, of student uh, uh, evaluations, of flipping the classroom. It is not simply a matter of filming a professor and putting it on a small screen. It is really transforming how, pe how, how students learn and how we teach. Which brings us to the third issue, to the third force. First, politics and finances. Secondly, technology. And the third, I think, cultural readiness. I think cult society is ready for the possibilities of this technology in terms of transforming higher education. Just think of our students today. I love going to meet with our undergraduate students, and I've discovered some interesting things. Even when they're all in the, in the same room, in the large room, do you know how many of them communicate? They text each other. They're looking for dates. How do they do it? They go online. For them, virtual reality is reality. And this notion that this generation or the next generation coming in the next few years will sit through a class for 50 or 60 minutes and have one-way transmission of information, it will not disappear. But I don't think that that will be the norm in the future. And I will just conclude with this. We're about to plan right now the first learning and teaching center on this campus in 50 years, a building dedicated exclusively to learning and teaching, $50 million. And as I was looking at some of the very preliminary designs, what I see is classrooms in terms of the traditional auditorium style. And I said, are we spending $50 million to design a classroom for teaching the way it was done in the 20th century? I don't think so. So the challenge for us is leaving aside the uses of MOOCs in terms of transforming education in emerging nations, is how will MOOCs transform in-person residential education at the top-notch public research university. I don't know how it will transform it, but I do know that that is a challenge before us in the 21st century, and that conversation begins today, thanks to the uh, Future of Information Alliance, and thanks also very much to the Deutsche Foundation. They have supported the Future for Information Alliance very generously. They have supported the symposium. Jane Brown, the president, is uh, wanting to be here, but she's flying on a plane. I don't know if it has Wi-Fi and so whether she can see this uh, program. But the chief operating officer, Neil Diedrichson, is here. And Matt McClure, one of the directors, thank you very much for the support of, uh, of this program. And uh, thank you all for being here today. Thank you, President Lowe. Now it's my pleasure to introduce Paul Sparrow, who is uh, our host and is the Senior Vice President of Broadcasting here at the museum. Paul. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, President Lowe. I think um, your support for this alliance is critical and visionary on your part, understanding that interdisciplinary cooperation is the future, understanding that technology platforms are a, a tool that we can use to get to that future. And, I think the University of Maryland has taken a real impressive leadership role in this. Um, I also want to thank Ira and Allison. Obviously, none of this would have been possible without them and their hard work. Uh, I did clock in at 7,000 emails I've received from them in the last two weeks, but um, it's okay. I have a spam filter now that puts them in a separate folder. Um, the museum's mission is to champion the freedoms of the First Amendment um, and to try to use innovative and um, inspiring ways to communicate to a new generation. Um, one of our core values is that people have a need to know and journalists have a right to tell. And that flow of information has traditionally been lecture-based. The journalists, whether they're newspapers or television shows, tell you what they think the news is and you consume it. And that model has changed. And it has changed fundamentally, it has changed irrevocably, and it has changed in a very, very good way. We think of it as the democratization of news. I think that's exactly what you're seeing in, up in uh, higher education right now. You're seeing the democratization of knowledge. You're seeing ways of, of sharing knowledge in, in new and radically different uh, platforms that have broken away from the 19th century model of a classroom and a lecturer, just the way new media has broken away from the tradition newspaper or television show. 
I think it's vitally important. I think it's really, really helpful that you have this interdisciplinary collaboration going on where people are really trying to talk about what do we do with this information? What is in the digital world? What is important? How do you archive it? How do you share it? How do you make sure that everyone has equal access to it? These are big questions. The development of, of video lecturing, the idea of flipped classroom, the idea of MOOCs is really at the very forefront of this idea of the democratization news. I'm very excited about the program we're going to have here today. Um, we're proud to be part of the uh, founding partner in the Future of Information Alliance. I think you're all ready to hear from our great panel, and we're going to start with the Vice President from the University of Maryland, Pat O'Shea. Pat. Thank you. Thank you. Friends, colleagues, uh, futurists, I'm Pat O'Shea, the Vice President and Chief Research Officer at the University of Maryland. I oversee the creation of all useful knowledge at the university. And I'll be your moderator for the portion of the program coming from the museum in downtown Washington, DC. I'd first like to introduce Dan Russell. Dan comes to us from Google, where he is Director of User Happiness. That's got to be the best job title I've ever heard. Although we've given, given him another job title here, because he helped us um, last year launch the Future of Information Alliance when he was a visiting futurist. And now he's back with us as a resident futurist. So please welcome Dan Russell. Thank you, Pat. Um, I'm very happy to be the, the futurist in residence, and I appreciate the promotion. And I'm looking forward to my future promotion as a futurist for life. <laughs> but we'll see how that comes out. Um, I'm, I'm really happy about this year's program for the Future of Information Alliance. Um, you think in, in the future we're going to have a couple of really exciting things going on. In February, we're having a special meeting about crowdsourcing, about how all of you can make all of us smarter and vice versa. So in May, then, we'll be having uh, another colloquium, another set of meetings around the topic of big data. Big data is the key to lots of the advances we've seen both in science in the past few years and in, I think, in future education. So I'm looking forward to that. The Future of Information Alliance is also sponsoring a seed pr research program for students. And we're looking for the future in those folks as well. I'm excited to be here. And I'm glad this is all working out the way it is working out, because if you think about what's going on with education, there are too many challenges and there are too many interesting opportunities here for any one little group to hang on to by themselves. This is truly a multidisciplinary kind of activity and it behooves all of us to pay attention to what's going on and help drive this forward into the future because if you think about it, uh, we need to understand and shape the future lest our information families get rolled over by the future. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, I'm Jane Clark. I'm the Dean of the School of Public Health. I welcome you all here to this location. Um, I'm also the chair of a task force where uh, you're basically all going to help us with the answers to the task force, which is exploring the intersection of MOOCs, online learning, blended learning, and the future of higher education, particularly here at the University of Maryland. I'll be moderating today's program uh, here at the University of Maryland. Each of our futurists in both locations, we'll speak for 10 minutes. My role is to keep them at 10 minutes. Um, and then we'll take a question from each location, one here and then there, uh, and then move to the next speaker. So it'll be 10 minutes, one question, one question, and then 10 minutes again. And then at the end, we'll come back and we'll have an open forum for all of the futurists. Um, we will start here shortly with Kevin Carey, who is the director of the Education Policy Program at the New America Foundation, who also blogs for the Chronicle of Higher Education. At the museum, we will hear from Peter Strzok, a professor of the classics at the University of Pennsylvania, who has been teaching a MOOC on Greek and Roman mythology. Here at Riggs, we also have Anat Argawal, a professor of electrical engineering and computer science at MIT and the president of edX, launched by Harvard and MIT, to offer MOOCs and to study their potential. And then finally, we will hear again from Dan Russell, who you just heard from, who has taught MOOCs on searching the web 
And now, let's start with Kevin Carey. Thank you. Good afternoon, and thanks for the opportunity to come. And, um, I've been asked to provide some context for this discussion of MOOCs, which are one of those acronyms that I guess we're stuck with, uh, like blogs, kind of a, a word that doesn't really trip off the tongue, but it's the word that we all use now. And um, in some senses, one could begin to tell this story of MOOCs uh, about a year and a half ago, less than that, summer of 2011, when the New York Times ran a story at Stanford University um, in artificial intelligence that the professors had somewhat of their own volition decided to uh, let anyone in the world take for free. And that this publicity and the um, inherent ability of Stanford University and the people that were teaching it um, instigated a, a, a level of participation orders of magnitude larger than I think anyone there had participated, uh, had anticipated. But in another way, I think you can begin this story much, much earlier. I would arguably take it all the way back to the 18th century, where um, if you look at the classified advertisements in the newspapers in Boston, this is pre-revolutionary Boston, you can find advertisements for correspondence courses in shorthand. There were people that said, if you want to learn shorthand, we will send you materials and you will send it back to us um, and we'll grade it. And this was a form of distance education. But actually, the, uh, the pre-revolutionary and then post-revolutionary uh, shorthand courses didn't really take off until there was a major development in information technology. And that development was the Postal Service. The US government came along and created an open communications network. Anyone could, go to, to, could drop something in the mail. Uh, it was a universal communications network, or as close as they could, could make it to universal. It was reliable and it was built and subsidized in a way that people could afford it. And so what that did was create a market for distance-based correspondence courses in shorthand that had never existed before. And all of a sudden there were people all over the country at the time who were taking these classes because this, this sea change in information technology had happened. And if we look at the history of higher education in this country and around the world, this is what we see. The impulse to help people learn at a distance is not new. Um, it has been punctuated by improvements in information technology all the way along the way. So radio was invented, uh, microfilm was invented, television was invented, and every time this happens, educational institutions have adapted uh, and used it to reach people. But what hasn't happened, um, despite, and you can find people saying this all the way along, what hasn't happened is that those changes in technology have not really altered the fundamental nature of the educational institutions themselves. And so to kind of uh, go to the question that was just posed to us by our president, I think very well a few moments ago, what are the implications of these massive open online classes for the residential public university as we know it? I would offer to you today, and, and I will perhaps walk a little bit farther out on that prediction limb than some people will, that this time is different that this change, in this change in information technology really will have an effect on, on the nature of this, these organizations that the previous changes have not. Um, and the reason is twofold. One, uh, the technology is simply much, much better than it was before. We are a long way from the Postal Service, or even from radio, or even from television. Um, and the key difference is that not only can we communicate information to people at a distance, but the same information technology tools that allow us to uh, somewhat unidirectionally or asynchronously, uh, passively let people move information back and forth, uh, are now creating very, very sophisticated and active learning tools um, that we'll hear a little bit more about in a few minutes um, that not only uh, equal in quality the kind of instruction that people receive on campuses like this one today, but surpass them um, in certain subjects in certain areas and that the vector of that improvement is moving very quickly in one direction. So what are the implications of that for in institutions? Well, I'll move to my first slide, um, which you can't see the upper left-hand corner. I apologize for that. Um, what this is is a representation of what mo someone might call the higher education value chain. Um, and what has happened in the last year or so is this. Um, in the upper left-hand corner, it says the content loop. Um, this is basically the beginning of education 
uh, in, in higher education. And what has happened over the last year is this. Um, starting with these Stanford courses and then with the development of MITx last December, which became edX, um, and new companies like Coursera and Udacity, is we are now in a world where anyone can access high quality, credible, well-branded uh, education content anywhere they want, at any time they want, for free. And I assert to you that that is the world we live in today, and that is the world we are going to live in forever. Free for everyone. High quality content, anytime you want it, anywhere you want it, to anyone who wants it in the entire world who can access a communications network. We are never going back from that. That starts to change the underlying economics of the higher education business. But as we all know, anyone who's involved in this enterprise of higher education, content is not maybe the beginning of the education process, but it is certainly not the end of it. There are a whole range of additional um, elements to higher education, particularly if our, if our ambitions for higher education are as authentic and high as they ought to be. Um, we've had free content, one could argue, for 500 years since the invention of the printing press, and yet we need and have, have had universities during all that time. And so, starting in the upper left and going clockwise around, this is a representation of what I would say are uh, uh, escalating um, levels or, or stages in the higher education value chain, all of which are currently encompassed by comprehensive universities like this one. So, we start with the content, we have very learned people who uh, uh, bring their, their knowledge and expertise, they create courses, they create opportunities for learning. Um, but of course, like we provide uh, a signal of achievement, achievement velocity on the very top right there. The selection process means a lot in our higher education systems. We pick and choose who can attend certain institutions, um, and that choice, that selection process, and signals to the labor market. We provide credentials. Uh, officially sanctions and endorsed credentials that people can go out and those credentials fit inside of established employment systems and that has a great deal of value. We create, um, when we talk about degree programs and degrees, we all know that degrees aren't just um, a random collection of 120 credits, that majoring in a, in a subject means something, that that uh, represents the judgment of an academic community about a progression of things that you have to learn. Um, uh, and that all of these things are kind of encompassed in the university experience. But of course, that's also not all. We go down to the bottom right. This says meta content and skills, things like models of thinking and doing, performance feedback. We know that an awful lot of what you, you get when you go to a college and university is not learning facts. It's not gathering information because, of course, facts and information are things that are accessible to us all the time. It's think. perspectives. Um, and, and ways of understanding the world. These are really, in a lot of ways, the things that stay with us throughout our lives. And universities provide that also. And then we get all the way to the bottom left, and it says a transformative experience, a rite of passage, a culture of personal exploration. These are all things that colleges and universities provide to students. Um, so what we've done, what I think MOOCs represent, is the, is the continuation of a process where the foundation, the content foundation of higher education has now been changed very quickly um, in a way and very permanently. Again, what, what the kind of the funny thing that happens when as information technology, particularly the World Wide Web and the Internet, um, came upon us, you know, up on 20 years ago now, is that uh, a lot of the, the things that we're talking about today, a lot of the things that I'm saying to you right now, uh, people were saying back then, well, this is going to change everything and, and, and content will be free. Um, and yet what happened along the way was, um, the provision of higher education online, which certainly didn't start this year, it certainly wasn't, in, wasn't invented by uh, the MOOC providers, stayed within the existing higher, higher education system economically. So people could take online classes, but the way that we provided them and the them were kept within the existing economic system. You would pay the same tuition or perhaps even more tuition to take an online class. And a lot of the growth at scale was happening in the for-profit industry. And so online classes in the market kind of acquired a bit of a, a taint of profit seeking. What has happened in the last year as some of the world's great universities 
um, have endorsed the idea of online education and, per, and decided to give it away for free is that there's been this inversion where online classes are going from being seen as kind of down market and kind of expensive to very up market and at no cost at all to take them. So what I think is going to happen in the future is this, and this is my prediction. First of all, a lot of the things that will happen in the immediate future in the online world won't happen here in the United States. So here's my next slide. This is Coursera's first million students. And let's, let's pause and reflect on that. The word Coursera didn't exist 12 months ago. This company, Coursera, was founded in, I think, February or March of this year. Um, it's a, a competitor, I think, to edX of a kind. You know, Anand is here to talk to us about edX. Um, it encompasses classes offered by professors at some very well-known universities. But Coursera didn't exist a year ago, and now we can put up a graph that says Coursera's first million students. That tells us what a demand there is for this kind of online education, and that tells us how fast it can grow. The second thing you'll see is that most of those students are not American. 38.5% from the United States, and then we see Brazil, India, China, Canada, United Kingdom, Russia, the so-called BRIC countries. Um, huge population, developing countries, um, but these are people from all over the world for whom their choice is not, do I go to the University of Maryland College Park, or do I go online? Their choice is, do I do nothing? or do I go online? There's a tremendous pent-up demand among a large and growing global middle class for higher education. And these American universities, and American higher education has such credibility around the world, are the first to really open themselves up and, and uh, serve that demand, and, and so we get things like a million students. So I think what will happen for the next uh, probably five to 10 years is that m much of the ferment and the growth will happen outside of the United States because it's not regulated. It's not subject to a lot of the uh, political issues that we work, work with here. A lot of the competitive institutions, they either don't exist or they're not subsidized to the same level. Um, so we'll have all kinds of things happening basically out, out of our control, um, out there in a, in a, in a cross-border world in terms of the development of these courses, the use of these courses, the development of credentials to go with these courses, um, and the effect of all those things on the labor market and the way that students compete with each other internationally. Um, so we should prepare for that. It's not going to happen overnight. I think in is quite like the newspaper industry in places like this. Ghost towns in two years are going to be fine for everyone. I don't think we should worry about it. But uh, if there's one thing I think that is, very, is more and more true as every new provider comes out and every new online class is out that comes along. Uh, it seemed very distant, seems closer and closer and closer to the present. If, you, if, if we had had this conference two years ago and we had all given our best guess about how long is this process of transformation going to take, I think we would have had one set of numbers. That set of numbers is becoming smaller and smaller and smaller. And so I think the challenge for this university and every university is to look back at this chart and ask yourself, of all what am I really good at? How much does it cost me to provide these things? And how much are people willing to pay for them? Right now, all of these things are encompassed inside of one big conglomerate institution. Um, the quality of them, frankly, varies quite a bit. Um, and the way that they're paid for is all mashed together in a system of cross-subsidies where people come in and they pay one price for all of those things. And if one thing we know about information technology is that it tends to split big conglomerate institutions into pieces, and people come in and they compete in each segment of the market, I can any of those charts or any of those slices right there and find a tech company out there who only wants to do that. And so um, it's a great opportunity for institutions with expertise and credibility, but it's also going to be, I think, kind of a perilous time um, in a time where some people will be very, very successful uh, and others will, quite frankly, be left behind. Thank you very much.
So we'll have one question for, at this end, and then we'll have this question, then we'll switch to the museum. For Kevin? Uh, I'm Michael Kaliska. I'm a graduate student here at the journalism school in Maryland. Um, I'm in my third year of my PhD. Can everyone hear you? I hope so. Um, I, my question is a little bit uh, to the social aspect you've been kind of you know, talking about a little bit. Um, I think, uh, can you talk a little bit more about the limitations of MOOCs? Because I think sure. learning is very much a social uh, experience and being online, that's one thing, it's great to get the information, but the experience you have in a classroom, the interaction with your professor or, or even your fellow students in one particular space that maybe just the classroom or the college or even the campus in itself, I think it's an invaluable experience and I don't know how this would be changed or transformed through MOOCs. Thank you. Uh, so two responses. One, um, obviously a lot of social could happen on the internet. That's been, you know, much of the explosion of the use of the internet over the last five to ten years has been in the social aspect of it. Second, the question we should ask ourselves about these new classes um, is not, are these MOOCs as good as the best of what higher education can be? Right now the answer I think is no, although it varies quite a bit. Um, the question is, uh, how good are these MOOCs compared to typically what higher education is for regular students? One can always posit an ideal of um, a very strong relationship between a scholar and a teacher and their students and the students to one another, um, usually in a small environment. We, we have institutions that provide that ideal right now that is very atypical and it's very expensive. Uh, so the question is what happens to our higher education structure if MOOCs can't, are as good as 70% of what most students today are experiencing, particularly when they're paying the same price for that 70% as they are for the really good stuff. Okay, Patrick, do you have a question? Uh, Rakan Nasruddin, intern Patton Boggs. You spoke about how the immediate future won't be the United States, that would be abroad. Um, and your exact words were because of political issues. Uh, can you elaborate on these political issues that you think are gonna hinder the US uh, being the forefront of MOOCs? So let me make a distinction. I think the U.S. will be at the forefront of uh, creating MOOCs because uh, American higher education is the most well-respected higher education system in the world by far. People around the world aspire to attend our colleges and universities. Uh, our, our most famous universities have tremendous and in many ways um, untapped brand equity in this phrase. Um, They've, they're, they're, these are institutions that are internationally renowned and yet by their design can only serve a very small number of students. Well, now they're able to, to reach students around the world. What I think is, what, so that part of it I think will come from the United States. The part that I think will happen mostly outside of the United States is the process by which people learning from these courses get credit for them, um, assemble that credit into some kind of credential that has value in the labor market. Because when you get into the credits and credentials part of things, that's where you've crossed the line into public subsidization and government regulation. Right now, only essentially government-endorsed institutions can take federal financial aid money. Only government-endorsed institutions can offer bachelor's degrees and master's degrees. That's not going to change overnight. There's a lot of barriers to people getting official course credit for uh, a MOOC or an, or an informal online class. We'll work through those things here in the United States eventually. I think they will get work, worked through much more quickly abroad where we don't have that regulatory environment. Hmm. Okay, Patrick. Next, we will hear from Professor Peter Strzok. Peter is a professor of classics at the University of Pennsylvania. Thanks very much for the introduction, Patrick. It's uh, uh, really exciting for me to be here. Uh, I appreciate the invitation from Ira um, to come and join you and from Allison. <clears throat> it's already been exciting for me, the conversations we've had this morning. Uh, the intensity that's brought to the discussion around teaching is new. This uh, amount of intensity around this question uh, just hasn't been something that has been happening around the water coolers, at least of my university. Um, my slides, I assume, are up and ready. Uh, I'm just gonna 
say that they are. Um, I've been teaching a course on uh, mythology at University of Pennsylvania for about 10 years now. I've been teaching a version of that course online for about nine. Um, in one fell swoop over the uh, last 10 weeks, I've taught more students uh, than I have taught in my last 10 years combined. Uh, so the numbers that we're getting in these uh, MOOCs are real, uh, they're serious, and they have a way of turning a person's head and making the person think about what it is um, that we're up to. Now, I thought I would start off by <clears throat> introducing us to the future. If you look at our, cla our, at our, um, our, our slide, you'll see there uh, an idea of what the future might be. Uh, we've got a professor there who has more facial hair and smoking apparatus, making him look quite much more uh, authoritative than I think I ever will, uh, standing in front of a, a technology called the television pickup. And he has a transmitter sending his voice and image out to people with receivers uh, using loudspeakers and other things to understand what he's up to. Now, the quaintness of what this picture is all about, I think, is uh, interesting for us to meditate on for a second. Why is it that this looks so quaint? Uh, at the time, in the 1930s, when this uh, idea was uh, understood to be uh, the way that things were going to work, I think that we had a different idea of what it is that was possible in the particular medium of the broadcast television. Uh, the idea was, at the time, that the medium would become transparent to the message, that you could have a lot of good stuff that happened live. Now you could just send it out there. Uh, and people would look at it, it uh, in, direct, uh, with direct, uh, in a way that was directly proportional to their interest in looking at it in a live context. That turns out not to be true. Uh, the medium actually has a say over what happens in uh, what's possible uh, to be communicated over it. Uh, media are not transparent to the messages they send. In fact, they help shape and direct the kinds of messages that are possible to send in each format. Uh, the medium of television is really good for some things. It's good for narrative dramas that can be broken up in certain uh, uh, smaller segments. It works really well for that. It's good for entertainments. It's good for sports. It's great for news. Um, it was not conducive, it turns out, for, long, for doing serious, long-form academic work. It just didn't work out. Um, short segments, easy distractions, it just never caught on. Now, we have another medium that we can have a look at. <clears throat> this is one that we're all becoming quite used to. Um, it's, of course, uh, being, uh, some, it's something that we're uh, only uh, understanding now just what it's capable of. According to Moore's law, its capacity is doubling every 18 months. Oh, sorry, that's my son's soccer game. I gotta turn that off, okay. Um, it's also changing uh, industry into raising the possibility of frictionless capitalism, which is, oh, sorry. That's a meeting that I have in Philadelphia that just got changed, I'll have to change that. Um, we also are seeing that it's remaking every aspect of our communicate. Oh, sorry. Uh, that's a reminder. I've got an article that's due later. I should have shut that. Okay, sorry. So the medium, this particular medium that we're looking at, what is it possible to do in this medium? I don't know that we know that answer for sure. Uh, there are utopian visions uh, around, and I'm, I'm all for them. Uh, I am engaged in this process not because I'm a cynic. I am, I'm intrigued, and I think that means I'm equal parts um, skeptical and excited, and I'm, I'm a lot of both. Um, so I wouldn't be engaged in this otherwise. So this is a medium that, as we know, uh, does certain things really well. It does multitasking extremely well. Uh, it's it's uh, built on a, a way of providing us lots of different activities at any moment we want. Uh, it works really well at that part of us that twitches toward what it likes best at the moment. Um, and we'll see if we can make our, uh, 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 what we care about most in, a, in, a, in an educational environment, we'll see if we can make that really work uh, well in this medium. Now, I thought what I would do is just produce as a, uh, uh, a thought experiment what I would do if I were taking my course. Uh, so I've got uh, another slide here that's gonna help us, I think, take a look at that. This is, if I were taking my course, this a is discussion what I would do. Bill harkens back to our last, last lecture. I wanted to look at the ritual elements that are connected in Homer's uh, him to Demeter, and very specifically drawn out uh, and made reference to uh, in our story. There are strong identifiable links with one particular ancient festival, that is the Eleusinian Mysteries. I've uh, written on top of a map here to give us a description of what generally happens in Eleusinian Mysteries. Today, uh, you can see we start off with Athens. That uh, that's, uh, Jim Leland uh, as our manager. 2013 season, which we're extremely happy to be able to announce. They have them back. No, I'm sorry, but as a Tigers fan, I just had to put that up there. Uh, Jim Leland is going to be back with the Tigers. We're thrilled about that. Uh, but my point is, I guess it's been made, uh, the, the, the medium itself uh, welcomes your interest in all things all the time. 
Uh, and I don't, uh, this is not a, a moment of finger wagging to say, oh, they shouldn't be doing X or Y or Z. The medium is built for us to be doing X or Y or Z. Um, it's, it's one of, it, it is its great strength, I think, and we'll have to see if what we care about most in the classroom can be modulated and inserted into this medium. It definitely won't be in a transparent way. It will have a shaping uh, effect on what comes out. Uh, I spent a little bit of time at Stanford, and there was a colleague there named Cliff Noss. Um, he's a, a wonderfully smart uh, man who I just happen to meet socially, and I looked into his work. Uh, he works on uh, uh, how humans uh, interact with their uh, technology. Uh, he came up with the short form idea, my short form of his complex idea is that uh, multitasking is actually a euphemism for being distracted. Um, so in, in a world where one is distracted uh, a lot, is it possible to do the kind of things that we care about? I think a lot of this provokes us to ask the questions of what we really care about. Uh, and that's, uh, I think, uh, 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 the biggest piece of what I'm going to get to uh, in my conversation today. Um, the most thoughtful group of people I've seen <clears throat> that I've been exposed to, um, in addition to those I'm meeting today, uh, involved in this kind of thinking have come from this group, Coursera. Uh, this is a diabolically clever group of people who really care about learning and who are committed in, in the utopian way in the best possible sense. Uh, to what it is uh, that we can do with this forum. And again, that number at the beginning that I started with, it, it has a way of clearing the mind. It turns your head. 50,000 people are taking my mythology class, or signed up for it anyway. Um, <clears throat> the course runs uh, in a way that uh, I, I can give you a brief overview of. We have snippets of video that are the main component of the downstream part of this course. Um, still the most important thing, though, is the readings. Uh, I'm asking people and then a group of people giving them cues to task each other to complete readings of some of the great things out there. This is my commitment. Uh, the readings uh, that we're doing of Homer and Aeschylus and Sophocles, and these things are just amazing. They just do change your life. So we've set up a system that's encouraging people to work through this material uh, who are much smarter than I could ever be, uh, Homer, Aeschylus, and Sophocles. And so people are spending time with them, and there's no way to read those things without spending time. So in addition to the readings and the videos, we also have quizzes, some uh, peer-reviewed writing assignments, which I'll talk about, uh, both of which I'll talk about in a second, plus discussion forums. Uh, this is what makes up the course. Now, in delivering the video, uh, in, in producing the video, I thought I'd provide a, a, what it looks like from a, a professor's point of view uh, as you're producing your video. What happens to your audience? Well, your audience kind of looks like this. <clears throat> It actually doesn't uh, change its mind. It doesn't nod. It doesn't fall asleep when you're boring. It doesn't laugh when you're funny. Uh, it just looks like a lens. And you stare into it and do your very best uh, to try to figure out what's happening on the other side of the lens. The classroom that I enter looks like this. It's a blank green screen. Um, and that has its own uh, strengths. I mean, there's not a lot of props around that you can rely on, but it also has a sense you're flying without a net. It's just you up there talking. It's very different from entering into a regular classroom. Uh, there are uh, uh, built-in uh, 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 constraints on the time that this uh, format allows. I'm usually given 50 minutes. Uh, I actually think that my best 50-minute lectures are pretty good. Uh, I think that my worst 50-minute lectures are awful. So uh, to, to have someone come up to me and question me very thoroughly to say, should 50 minutes be the normal uh, default time of a lecture, I think that's healthy. Uh, but I'm also not sure that the normal default time of this particular medium is the right one is 10 minutes, exactly the amount of time that someone should spend thinking through uh, the kinds of materials that I want them to learn, at least that I can share with them in my lectures. Uh, is that the right time frame? I don't know. The, the, the format seems to have determined it already, and we'll see if that's right. Uh, one thing that comes up when people are talking about the video component of this class is another concept. Uh, that is the flipped classroom. Uh, the classroom gets turned upside down. And as I understand it, and as it's explained to me, what happens, you've got lecture on the one side, which is the synchronous part of the course. You've got reading and discussion section on the other side, which is the asynchronous part of the course. And a flip lecture seems to say that you're flipping these things around. So the asynchronous thing becomes synchronous, and the synchronous becomes asynchronous. But um, what you're really doing, I think, when you're talking about a flipped, lecture, a flipped classroom is you're doing this. You're taking the lecture and you're pitching it. And what you're doing, and what you're doing instead is you're replacing the lecture with videos. Um, that is, uh, there are strengths to that. Obviously, as I said, uh, my worst 15-minute lecture shouldn't be visited on anyone as punishment. Um, it would give, it would make waterboarding look pleasant, I think. Um, but it also means that we're deciding to switch media and toss out an old one and embrace a new one. I think without quite yet testing it. I'm ready to embrace it. I think the experimentation is good, but I can't predict. I think, unlike some of my colleagues, I can't predict what the outcome is going to be. 
Um, in terms of the other parts of the course, in addition to the video, uh, there are lots of other things that are involved. Uh, the, the, and I think President Lowe did a good job at the beginning of saying it's much more than just putting a, a camera in a classroom and seeing what you can get out of it. <clears throat> um, the kinds of assessments that are possible here, uh, this has uh, opened up a lot of questions uh, about MOOCs, and I think they're, again, healthy. It's, it's wonderfully healthy to see a lot of energy and intellectual excitement devoted to this. Uh, one question is about what kind of quizzes can I give on, uh, on, uh, on my online mythology class. What I care most about, I mostly can't test in a bubble form. Is one part of what I do another part of what And I look forward to the uh, colleagues that are engaged in this. And there may be ways, uh, through very clever uses of this forum, to, to, to generate uh, different kinds of assessments using that exact kind of uh, technology. Peer-reviewed writing assignments. This gets closer to what I really care about, is what students write uh, when they write their assignments. Uh, having peer review is extremely helpful from a couple of standpoints. I'll, let me just give you, though, a, a sort of two-fold uh, answer to the question of how I think they're working out. On the one hand, uh, in the, if we're drawing an, an analog to something like a blog uh, or like the peer grading that has been uh, going on in our writing courses for years, uh, to have other students grade the work of others is extremely helpful to, for them to learn. There is a great learning advantage in trying to evaluate someone else's work and figure out what it is they did right and figure out what it is they did wrong. It's a very useful recursive effect of those people uh, producing writing assignments grading each other. Uh, the second hand, though, if you make these into high stakes, where the grade assigned by peers is a regnant piece of what the evaluation of how you did in the course is, uh, I think it gets very tricky. So I think open-ended participatory kinds of uh, use of these, uh, this mechanism is better than a high stakes grade at the end that determines something like a certification or something else. Um, in terms of the discussion forum, uh, this is a part of the course that it was a huge eye-opener for me. Uh, it turns out that crowdsourcing pretty much works. It's true. Uh, the students get their questions answered in a, in a very finite number of minutes. And it's mostly not from me and my puny teaching team, uh, talented as we are, uh, as they are especially. Uh, we've got four of us that are working on our, uh, as, as best we can on the forum. But mostly what's happening is that they're answering each other's questions. Uh, within less than 20 minutes, uh, people get answers. And they get the right answers. And if the uh, answers they get aren't right, they get corrected very quickly. So crowdsourcing with this large of a number really works. In addition to putting up their own writing, though, the thing that's really interesting about this forum, and some of you will say social media, duh, and I will say, well, I'm new to this, um, well, is the, the simple like and dislike concept. Uh, that's a very straightforward binary judgment that people are making on something. It's not very subtle, but you aggregate them, and it's pretty subtle. Uh, so the students that are saying something that doesn't seem right, that maybe seems too uh, is not opposite to the material, they get voted down. Uh, the students that are saying something spot on get voted up, and the ones that get voted up go to the top. This is extremely uh, helpful and useful to have this massive crowd of people studying the texts I care about most and making insights that get valued and raised to the top. Uh, I've already learned a lot on what's uh, possible in the form. Now, uh, just to close, a couple of uh, sort of summary statements about what's possible in this, uh, in this medium. Uh, let's focus on some disruptions. All of these, I think, are good things. Um, we're having a, a, a disruptive uh, engagement, I think, in uh, the question of how our students should learn. Uh, that's obvious at the beginning. Uh, how do we shape the classroom such that it's a, a, a maximally enriched environment for learning? As I say, this is not something that uh, standing faculty, at least at my institutions, I'll say, have spent uh, enough time worrying about. We spend a lot of time worrying about other things, uh, but to have this guide a discussion urgently about what we care about most has been really salutary. And I think my colleagues feel that as well. Um, I don't think that the lecture format is a dinosaur, uh, the 50-minute lecture, but I'm, I think it should also have to prove itself. So I think that's a healthy thing. Uh, then we get to the 10-minute issue. I don't think that's settled as the absolutely maximum form to deliver information in. There's a salutary effect of making a person get to the point. That's important. But there's also an unhealthy effect of making a person get to the point. Some of what I care about most happens because in reaction to what the students are raising, we have a chance for digression uh, and a chance for uh, improvisation. Uh, we also are provoking a question about what uh, it is we think our students should learn. Uh, what is it that they're supposed to be learning in the classroom? <clears throat> this, I think, is extremely important. Uh, we're looking uh, now at a question of, uh, surely, uh, ideas about what education's all about. Are we there to transfer data? 
if we're there to transfer data, I think this is an extremely helpful way of doing it. You can transfer much more data over this kind of a broad format. Um, so what we're going to be able to do is make people better informed when they're making decisions on information. But there's another idea about what education is all about, and from the humanities, we have been connected to this idea for a very long time, and that is that education, a great education, is about a, trans is about a transformation. We're actually in the business of changing lives, and my colleagues, again, most of us will share this view. That's what we really, really want to have happen, and that's something that results in something different. It's not just better informed decisions on questions of information. We've got better judgments on questions of value, and I actually think that what we do uh, in our classrooms produces that outcome. We have students at the end of the time with us who are better at making judgments over thorny questions of value. Um, I hope that that's right, and I'm glad to be introduced to an environment which is grilling us on that, to say, are you really producing that? Uh, I, I'm, I, I think it's healthy that we need to uh, make our point. So we're at a point now, I think, where this openness uh, to, in this new environment is really bringing us to uh, a new set of observations that we can carry forward. Uh, in our own teaching. It's affecting our classroom. Uh, it's affecting our openness to being measured. It's changing, I think, things uh, for uh, already for uh, the better. Uh, we'll see where it all goes in its, in its uh, longer form, uh, but I think uh, making uh, this uh, into a really strong kick in the pants uh, to higher education is a really good thing. Dr. Strzok, thank you for your presentation. Uh, my name is June Ahn. I'm an assistant professor at University of Maryland. Um, and I really appreciated your comments about the media and how the medium itself shapes kind of our interaction with information, and particularly the uh, idea about distraction and multitasking, I think is something we can all relate to. And I was wondering if you could give us some more details about how you think uh, the nature of the medium that a lot of our students work with today um, and the ability to multitask, how does that change your practice or how should instructors think about their practice uh, given that constraint or reality? Uh, well, I, <clears throat> it's a great question and it's something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, worrying about, uh, talking with my students about. Uh, I'll give you a, a, um, a couple of different uh, answers. I'll make them short. Uh, number one, in my long form 50 minute narrative class where I sit down and I talk at them for 50 full minutes about Greek and Roman mythology, I have outlawed laptops, pagers, cell phones, everything goes away. The student, when I first did that, I was expecting, you know, revolution. I thought there would be, they would just hate this. Um, it turns out they loved it. They thought it was wonderful not to be distracted for that 50 minutes. Uh, I, I said, if you don't like this at the end, take it out on me on the course evaluations. I got higher course evaluations that year than I had the previous year. So I think that in that format, the short form uh, interruptive medium is not good. It's disruptive to that format. Now, I'm the same person, though, that's, that's ready to embrace this new technology. This is the part of me that's excited by it. And for that, I obviously am not going to outlaw laptops and like Coursera. I mean, how do you, how you get to me? Um, so uh, I think that we need to uh, learn more about what these forms are and how they shape our own cognitive engagement with the world. Uh, and uh, not only Cliff Noss, the man I mentioned at Stanford, uh, but many other smart people, including people on the stage, are working to try to understand what it is these new media do with respect to our own cognition. I'm going to always be ready to endorse the long form, meditative uh, 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 engagement in the material as being something that, that we can't get rid of. Uh, until someone comes to me and proves to me, you know, it's actually useless. I, I need to get that before I'm ready to toss it. We have a, Sarah. our second question will come here from Graves. Would you identify yourself as you ask the question? Sure. My name is Merrily. I'm a doctoral candidate here at the College of Journalism at the University of Maryland, and I'm a, an aspiring teacher. You've shared a great deal about your approach to online learning. Uh, you've given a number of examples of how it's different. I wonder if you can identify a transformative moment for you as a teacher when you cross that barrier and if you have any counsel for those of us who might be quite anxious to make that leap but a little frightened about the prospects um, yeah that, that's a, a, a great question I um, I think that my transformative moment in this uh, general medium <clears throat> excuse me um, happened 10 years ago when I first tried to teach a course online at Penn 
At that time, uh, we moved from the web to web 2.0, which was revolutionary, remaking the world and was the utopian future that we all imagined. It meant that everyone else produced content, not necessarily those that had web pages, but the content was being produced by everybody else. Um, and what was happening then was we were, my TA and I were put in a broom closet uh, in one of our uh, engineering buildings, literally a broom closet, and we had one camera and I lectured for a while and my TA was over here monitoring something called a chat room and we had an 800 line. And we had students that listened to me talk for a while. My TA would interrupt and say, we've got a great question here from Kansas City. Uh, we had the 800 line, people calling in. And we had uh, a huge openness on the part of the students to engaging in this. I, I thought, you know, what can I really, I wondered what I could really bring. I thought I had a chance. Uh, but to see the welcoming of the new format from the students was the most exciting thing. I think, um, you know, they, uh, when we care, obviously they care. Uh, that's that's a, a basic rudiment of what makes good teaching. And to experiment in a way that shows that you care about learning, as opposed to the idea that you're somehow um, in love with the, some latest technological bauble, um, if you show that you care about learning, I think that's obvious. And I think that's the thing uh, that people, the receivers and the, uh, and, and the transmitters of these messages, that's the thing that people care about most. Thank you, Peter. Our next futurist will be Anat Agarwal over here at, on our side at Riggs. Anat. <clears throat> Uh, thank you, Jane. Um, let me uh, let me start with a quick let me start with a quick uh, uh, a question for the audience. Um, let's flip this talk around. There's a lot of flipping going on. So uh, let's uh, let's find out. Um, so if you think back to uh, the past 200 years, I want you to think about what is the single biggest innovation in transportation. Okay, yell out yell out the answer. Segway, I love that. The single biggest innovation in your mind in transportation in the past 200 years. Railroads. Automobiles, let's go. Airplanes. Space travel, solid fuel, the jet engine, the list goes on and on. Okay, let's try the following now. Think back to the past 200 years. What do you think is the single biggest innovation in education in 200 years? Cheap books. What planet are you from? The books keep getting <laughs> the, the, the books keep getting more and more expensive. I read a book and then I have to buy the books back from uh, the for-profit book vendors for my own students. It's crazy. That was 500 years ago. Yes, the, the printing press indeed. You know, I've been wanting to say it, the printing press has been the single biggest uh, revolution in learning, uh, but not much else has happened uh, since then, as you can see from. Uh, the, 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 the lack of significant response from the audience. Uh, but, so let's take a look at this. Uh, so this is uh, a slide here. This is a classroom at uh, MIT uh, 50, 60 years ago. And uh, this is a classroom today. What's different? The seats are in color. Okay, that's the, if that's what we've done, if that's the extent of innovation and learning in one of the you know, uh, pretty significant institutions of technology in this little state up north, then uh, we are in real, uh, real trouble. So edX is a uh, not-for-profit online learning initiative founded by MIT and uh, Harvard. Uh, they invested a total of $60 million into the venture. And uh, it's a non-profit. Uh, it's also based on an open source platform. What edX is saying is that it will make its learning platform available uh, to the world for free. Everybody can have the source. And the idea here is that everybody can help improve the platform and uh, others that uh, can also use the platform on campuses to host their own courses. It is a portal for learning. So you can go to edX.org and uh, take a bunch of courses. The courses from Harvard are offered as Harvard X courses. Um, a number of universities have joined us in our consortium and uh, a number of uh, other universities will be announced soon. Berkeley as Berkeley X. Uh, the UT system with its 15 universities uh, uh, is part of the platform, and a few other universities coming up uh, pretty soon. A large part of what edX does is also research and learning. So we track, you know, as students learn, uh, we have uh, close to half a million students uh, uh, on our uh, platform as uh, students at edX, um, learners worldwide. And when these students learn, 
when they click on things, when they watch videos, when they do interactive exercises, we record everything. So we have our own big data, if you will. And uh, a lot of research is ongoing in terms of how students are learning. And our thinking is that we can use this data to really improve how students learn. And we've been doing uh, some of these experiments as A-B tests. Even in our very first course in the spring, if two professors disagreed about something, hey, look, we've got to teach this this way. And somebody else says, let's teach it this way. Heck, we said, let's do an A-B test. Half the students got one, other half got the other. And then at the end, uh, we looked at the student outcomes from a test and figured out which way was better. So we can do the live tests that was never possible uh, before. So the vision of edX is to provide dramatically increased access to learning for students worldwide, while at the same time improving on-campus education. So it's not just about MOOCs, but with edX, we're born of universities. My governing board is universities. There's a real clear passion for improving on-campus education. And to a lot of people, they could care less what happens. Whether they get millions of students signed up or not, it's more about, can I reinvent campus education? Um, in our first course offered in the spring, uh, the numbers were pretty staggering. Uh, when we launched the course, we had zero marketing dollars, and uh, we thought we'd get on the order of uh, a few hundred students, maybe twice that uh, we would teach in a normal class. In the first 10 hours of our launching uh, this website, edX.org, we had 10,000 students sign up from around the world. And before we knew it, we had 155,000 students taking the course, and our staffing was about the same as an on-campus class. And so to put that number, 155,000 in perspective, think about two things. This circuits course was one of the hardest courses at MIT. It uses differential equations as its prerequisites. And we announced it as such. And we still got 155,000 students signed up for the course. It was pretty, uh, you know, quite, uh, quite insane in terms of numbers. 155,000 is more students than all the alumni of MIT from its 150-year history. So you can see why foundations, the, the foundation relations and alumni departments at universities are really excited about this. So this is the new classroom. Okay, so we are all, ca all on campuses. We care about campus education deeply. So this is a new classroom. So completely unbeknownst to us, in this land far, far away, a high school teacher got together, high school teacher, okay, got together 20 students in their class and had them take this course. Okay, it was a blended class. Uh, the blended class is, uh, is a broader description of uh, the flipped classroom. In a flipped classroom, you do videos in your, you do lectures in your house and then you come back and do exercises in class. In a blended class, you somehow mix in-person teaching, in-person learning with uh, online learning, somehow. So in this blended class, students did uh, the, the video snippets and so on in their own uh, homes, and they came into class and did group discussions, group problem solving, and did a laboratory. So I have a little hint below. Uh, where do you think this was happening? Completely unbeknownst to us. Mongolia, that's it. Okay, in Mongolia, of all places, this blended class completely unbeknownst to us. And there, amazingly enough, we discovered uh, a real uh, prodigy, Batushig. A 15-year-old got a perfect score on the entire course. And the exam in this course was nasty. If I were to go and take the exam cold, I'd be lucky if I got 80% myself. This was a hard, uh, really, really hard course. So this is, uh, let me show you a quick picture here. Um, this is uh, a, the dashboard for a, an artificial intelligence course uh, taught by uh, Peter Rabiel and Dan Klein from Berkeley. It's a Berkeley X course. And so here, let me talk about kind of the basic elements of an online class. You heard Peter talk about some of these things. So maybe I'll talk about some of the unique aspects of uh, edX. Um, as is usual, you find uh, video snippets interleaved with uh, exercises. Okay, that's a key staple of online courses. Video snippets, five to 15 minutes long, interleaved with online exercises, where students are testing their knowledge through these finger exercises after watching a few videos. There's a discussion forum, the free textbook of the course, there's a student dashboard where students can see the grades instantaneously, and there's also other uh, aspects of the course like uh, an online laboratory and online homeworks. I'll talk about the online lab because uh, that is one of the real challenging aspects of MOOCs. How do you show something to students where they are creating stuff? 
It's one thing to watch videos and check exercises, but how do you teach someone creativity? How do, you give, how do you teach someone to build something? Give them a blank sheet of paper, how do you build something? So I'll show you a couple of examples of how you can do that. So these learning sequences, the staple of online learning, interleaved, interleaved videos with interactive exercises. Okay, and these were really popularized by, uh, the videos certainly been popularized by Sal Khan, uh, who interestingly was my student at MIT about uh, a decade ago. So we've been very heavily inspired by, uh, by Sal Khan. So these interactive learning sequences or videos interleaved with exercises have actually, been proved, have actually been proved to really help learning. Okay, so we've talked about online learning as making learning more efficient and so on, but really one reason we care deeply about it is that it can improve the quality of teaching as well. So here's some evidence of it. It's been shown time and time again, and uh, in this landmark study by Craig and Lockhart, uh, you know, uh, in 1970, 1972, 73, they showed that active learning really promoted just much better outcomes from students. Okay, this study has been quoted time and time again. And active learning where you are involving the students in learning, you get videos and you're asking them questions and getting them to respond, has been shown to be much, much better in terms of outcomes. So with online learning, not only are we going to make learning more efficient, reach more students, but we're going to improve the quality of learning substantially. And it's been proven. And all this stuff has been done, look at this, you know, 40 years ago. Okay, I think what's exciting now, all this data has been around. And people have known all these good things. You know, learning should be interactive. And a bunch of other stuff. But, you know, as educators, you know, as, as, as professors and so on, we've largely ignored these studies. What's amazing is that for the first time, certainly for me, we've been looking at these pieces of research and saying, oh my God, what we're doing has been demonstrated to be a good thing 40 years ago. Okay, so all these studies, that I'm, I'm, I'll give you a couple more, have been done 30, 40 years ago. Okay, we're going rediscovering these things in an online format. This is an example of a video we've been inspired uh, very heavily by Sal Khan. Here's a Khan-style video. And in this medium, in this new media, you, know, you can imagine sticking a video, of a camera in front of a classroom and recording professors. But as uh, President uh, Lowe said, you know, that's like recording a stage. The new media gives us much better, much better ways of recording videos and so on. And here's one example. This is what I call a Khan-style video, where uh, you use handwriting and, uh, and, uh, and gesturing and, and sketching and so on to engage the student. So here's a, just a quick little okay, video. So you snippet. see this uh, amazing thing happening? And the key is that the stable point is when V plus equals V minus. Okay, it's not exactly equal. Okay. But you get the point. And the point is that uh, the handwriting and the, and the personal interaction has been, have been proven to be much, much better in terms of learning than sticking a camera in front of a classroom. And again, there's evidence of it. And this was research done uh, in 2003, over a decade ago, that... Uh, where students were able to get this kind of personal attention, where they could hit a pause button and self-pace themselves, as opposed to sitting in a lecture and just listening to stuff, can be much, much better in terms of outcomes than if they are given a completely uh, non-paced uh, lecture. Another really important thing is uh, exercises where students interact with the computer and they get graded uh, instantly. This is a big deal. So here's a quick video of uh, doing chemistry. Okay, our pl edX platform supports chemical equations, and you'll see some examples of that. So what's instant, uh, interesting here is that you get instant feedback. The computer checks and grades these things, unlike homeworks where you submit a homework in your, in your classrooms and you wait uh, two weeks and th then you may get your homework back. Here, students get instant feedback. And students are telling us that they love this instant feedback. Okay, in fact, students have written on our discussion forums that the green check mark has become a cult symbol. They go to sleep dreaming of the green check mark. And they're working much, much harder because of this instant feedback. In fact, a student that took uh, our course in the spring and is now taking a Berkeley course had this to say about the green tick mark when he went on to the Berkeley forum. <laughs> so, so you know, a previous person asked a question, what is the single biggest thing you've learned in this exercise? And for me, it's the following, that instant feedback is a game changer. Instant feedback to students will dramatically change the learning experience and dramatically change learning outcomes. And you know what? I learned that a few months ago. 
but the educators have known that forever. There you go. Let's take a quick look at this quote. That rapid, rapid feedback, instantaneous feedback to students, will improve learning outcomes than if you do not give instant feedback. Okay, this was a study done by uh, uh, Chen et al. Uh, a couple of years ago. And there are many, many such studies where they've shown that giving students feedback very quickly will actually improve learning outcomes than uh, not doing so. So I promised to talk a little bit about uh, creativity. Okay, as I said, it's one thing to have students watch videos and uh, watch interactive exercises, look at some exercises, but that teaches you analysis. How do you teach students creativity? How do you teach them design? So design about, is about giving students a blank sheet of paper and then go create something where nothing existed. So on the edX platform, one of the things we do is we, we are creating these online laboratories. So we give them a blank sheet of paper, okay? And on the, just think of this as a lab. And on the right-hand side, they get a parts kit, a bunch of components, and they get some analysis tools on top. And I'll show you a video of a student building something. Okay, they're gonna take the components, just as, like they play with Legos, they're gonna build something and analyze it. And students are telling us that they're having a lot of fun as they go around building these things. In fact, on the platform, you can take this lab, you can stick it on the wiki, and students can collaborate and build things together. Let me give you a quick uh, a demo of uh, a student doing something here. So you see a student uh, you know, built a little circuit and analyzed it, and uh, they can check it and they get the green check mark. So this, this is about design, this is about creativity. And this has been a challenge for online learning, and it requires some sophisticated tools in order to be able to, uh, in order to, be able to do this. Multimedia is really big. You can bring multimedia into the platform, and uh, you know, just in case you are wondering, you know, should we be introducing multimedia stuff gratuitously into a course, it turns out that there's another study. Okay, Mayer demonstrated that uh, if you take a narration alone or text alone and you add multimedia content to it to enhance it, that will improve, improve learning outcomes. Okay, so all of these things have been proven to be good ideas. So here's an example of bringing music into the classroom online. Okay, so this is an online lab where students can play around with components and uh, uh, you know, uh, watch, in this case, the students pick reggae music as they're learning, and the music is passed through a circuit, and they listen to what, this, what the music sounds like as it comes out through a circuit. And all of this analysis is done by the computer. So this is uh, a video of a student interacting with this uh, online music-based laboratory. So now the students changes the design, and just the, the sound will be muffled because they built a different kind of filter. So here you can see that using computers and using technology, we can bring these things and through simulation, do all kinds of fun laboratories. The students not only have fun, but they also can learn as they, uh, you know, as they do so. And, and to us as teachers, the really fun part is that students seem to be really enjoying it. So here's a, I'll end with this, with this quote from the discussion forum from uh, one of our students from uh, Pakistan. Thank you. So our first question, please identify yourself. Uh, hi, I'm Rocky, and I'm a grad student at the I School for Information Management. And I had a question, as, in, uh, as the name says, uh, MOOC, which is a massive open online courses. As the word says, open, uh, as in it's open to all. How would we uh, avert the digital mimicry or stealing of the ideas and the coursework available? Yeah, I missed the last part. Would you say it again? Uh, how would we avert the digital mimicry or stealing of the ideas and the coursework available online? Um, I guess the, the, the sound is not all that good. Oh, oh, um, it's, it's actually very, very easy to steal ideas from, uh, from here. 
we're actually going to give them away. So as I said earlier, uh, with edX, we're a nonprofit. And uh, we, have, uh, uh, we are going to make our platform open source. Open source means we're going to give it to you. So the, so the easiest way to steal it is just to take it, because we're going to give it away. And, and this is a nonprofit, and that's part of our mission. So we hope everybody will take it and, it's, uh, and, and, and improve upon it. That's the, uh, th that's the nice thing about open source. Okay, I'm um, Professor Bill Pugh, Professor Emeritus of Computer Science at University of Maryland. Um, you've all talked about lectures, um, exercises. Those are things that are people have shown it's really well to do in online services. You can do them really well. The big challenges are um, feedback on substantial assignments that the students have done, whether these are essays, proofs in mathematics, um, substantial um, software that the students have written. Um, getting good feedback on those is really hard. Even for computer software, some things you can test, but you also want to give students feedback on whether or not the software is actually designed well. And students have pr questions as they come in for office hours, where the, you really have to have somebody who understands the problem look at what the students have done and say, give them feedback on how to write the code or how to structure their essays. And the question is, is how does that work in the land of MOOCs? I mean, having professors give back information doesn't scale when you have 10,000 students. And when you have 10,000 students, one of the challenges for peer evaluation is that you've got a tremendous range of student ability and student motivation. One of the big advantages of peer discussions at a university is that there have been some filters apply. You hope that the students are all of a tighter ability range and that they're all actually present there and motivated to finish the course. As opposed with MOOCs, a lot of people sign up not being seriously committed to the course and then if those students are tasked with giving peer evaluation to somebody else, they're not going to get it. So how do you give students feedback on their substantial assignments that approaches even the level of what they would be getting from an average professor at a community college who probably gives students really good feedback on their essay? It's a good question. Uh, let me start with answering a broader question, which is, now how do you do some of the more challenging things in MOOCs? And uh, until I showed people the online labs, they used to ask me two questions. How do you do labs in MOOCs? And how do you, do, uh, how do you grade free form content? So um, I think we've cracked online labs. I think if you look at some of the courses, we have online, uh, various forms of online interactivity, uh, not just for circuits, but for in physics, in chemistry, and, and several other areas as we expand the tools. In terms of grading free, free form content, that is a real challenge for MOOCs. Okay, there are, a few ways in which we are doing things right now, such as, uh, as, such as peer grading or using machine learning and, and techniques like that. I think that's, that's one step in that direction. But the real challenge is how do you provide detailed feedback in, uh, for, for an essay or for a programming assignment or for a proof? So we're looking at a number of approaches to do it. And uh, I think it still remains a research question. One example is uh, we are working with Professor Robert Miller, who is a professor of computer science at uh, MIT. And uh, he's got a really neat system that he's using on campus where he uses all the alumni from his course in a crowdsourcing system where he takes up the whole, say, a programming assignment, and he distributes it among the alumni of students who have taken the course. So they've done, so they've got some background. And then they provide detailed feedback and comments on the program, and he's got a system whereby he can use voting and so on and filter the comments and give them back to the students. So that is one approach where you can try to be careful in terms of how the feedback is given, use voting to synthesize the feedback. But that said, it still remains an open problem. And uh, the good news is that uh, you know, we're marching down, and hopefully over time, we will have figured out answers to some of these really challenging issues. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, and, uh, and now we are going to hear from Google's director of user happiness and the University of Maryland's resident teacher, Dan Rupp. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. Um, I teach a lot. You don't know. I teach fourth graders. I teach librarians. I teach kids in high school. I teach at university. I teach rocket scientists at NASA. I teach people how to search. Seems like you all probably know something about that, but I teach people how to do it, and so I know actually Nobody's any good at it. 
So it's a fundamental skill that, that I'm trying to teach. And over the past couple of years I've been doing this, my manager keeps saying, Russell, how are you going to scale? We're Google. We have billions of users. How are you going to scale? And so uh, not long ago, my manager's manager said to me, Russell, you got to scale. You need to do a MOOC. And I thought, I'm in deep yogurt. What am I going to do? Because we didn't have any MOOC technology around. So uh, the fundamental thing that I wanted to do with my MOOC was to solve this problem, to teach people how can you search more effectively. So um, here's the story of my MOOC, basically. Uh, I wanted to start with this basic need. I need to teach people how to search. Search is easy to do, but if you're going to be a sophisticated user of it, you've got to know a little bit. So I need to be able to communicate that idea about what's possible while doing that effectively in the MOOC structure seemed ideal for that. So let's go ahead and let's do a MOOC. Um, and so I negotiated with my manager, uh, how many students are we going to try to reach? And I got him to say a little bit more than 20,000. Great. I thought, wow, <laughs> how am I going to do that, right? Um, and uh, because it's Google, you said objective measures, and you said you've got to get students that are doing at least 33% better at the end versus the beginning of the class. Great. I need to have an analytic before, in the middle, and at the end. Okay, so I can do that. I work at Google. So what I do is actually try to make this happen by building our first MOOC. And we did this uh, in the middle of this past year. And it's like the edX MOOCs, or it's like the Coursera MOOCs. It's kind of got little video pieces and some stuff on the right hand, on the left hand side for navigation, and it works pretty well, right? The cool thing about it, though, from our perspective, was that it was relatively short. It was not a 10-week class. It was only a two-week class. It was only six hours of, of actual instruction material with a couple hours of uh, assessments and these assignments that you have to do. So it was a relatively compact class. We also did it in what we think of now as a semi-synchronous style. So your typical class, when you go to lecture hall with your other 300 compadres, is you're synchronous. You're listening to a lecture speak in real time. Okay, you go away. What I mean by semi-synchronous is we launch the materials on one day, and then there's discussion forums, there's going back and forth, there's all the stuff that happens. Participation goes like that. You then launch the next one, and you get a participation curve like that, and so on and so on. So nothing happens synchronously. But it doesn't happen arbitrarily any time within the month or the year. You actually have to be co-present. You have to be attending to the forums as they go along. There's value in having a cohort that's going along with you. So we did a bunch of these. We go through the entire class. And the final exam was uh, due on July 23rd. So we started the class. Um, it was two weeks, starting on the 10th, going to the 23rd. Okay, So that's the pattern here. So as with the other ones, we had this existing conventional content. And what I had to do was to take that body of content and figure out, how can I break it up? And I discovered, as, as Peter was just saying, you can't just take a 50-minute class and chop it into five, five and 10-minute chunks of video. It's intrinsically a different medium, right? The jokes don't work. OK, so our MOOC is, is uh, 32 lessons, four hours of content, two hours of exercise. Not that big a thing. But I wanted to give you a little bit of the pragmatics of building one of these things. So uh, we formed my team on, on May 14th. And our version that had to be delivered was six weeks later. So we opened our registration on June 25th. And we had our testing. And this is an important point. We had our testing for the course in the seventh and eighth weeks. Okay, So here's the schedule, roughly. We had that first week to sort of figure out how to organize our team, who was going to be there. We then had the next two weeks to figure out what the design spec, what the goal of the class was, how we were going to do it, how much software did we have to write, and so on. In the fourth and fifth weeks, we actually wrote the code. Okay, This is for an entire class. And then in the sixth and seventh weeks, we actually wrote, had the first version, so V0, and we tested it. Remember the testing idea? How many of your classes? that you went to were tested? Raise your hand. Well, uh, people in College Park, you're doing the same thing, right? Raising your hand? OK, nobody here has raised their hand. What is it? Come on. This is an important engagement that you've got. And you didn't test it? So we tested it. It's a good thing, too. We found lots of bugs, both conceptual, software, and overall in the architecture of the class. 
we couldn't take those hour-long chunks and just divvy them up, so we had to really, really do some, redo a few things. So we retested this, and what was important was then launching and then iterating. So this sounds a lot like what? Sounds like software. Gee, courseware, software, it's kind of the same thing. In a lot of ways, it's actually fundamentally and interestingly the same. So our first design challenge was to be, produce that software. We wanted to test it up to 100,000 potential simultaneous users, so we did that, and we had a bunch of integration issues that we had to solve, but it's just software engineering, we know how to do that. The important thing was testing, checking, and validating that content. Our second requirement was then to take that content and produce it in these little tiny elements, because they not only have to stand on their own as little chunks, but have to then feed into the larger narrative arc. So we have this interesting rewriting problem. It's not like writing for radio. It's not like writing for television. It's like writing, it's like writing for MOOCs. We also wanted to design a community because as a lot of people have noticed, and a lot of people said here already, teaching and learning, importantly, doesn't happen in isolation. What's important is being part of a network of scholars, a collection of students that can help you out. So we, in our, in our particular social design, set up a group, a Google group, per lesson. So lesson 3.1, there's a lesson group for that, okay? What I found fascinating was that groups also sprung up spontaneously, not in part of our superstructure. So there were several Facebook groups that sprung up and meet on groups that sprung up to support the class. They wouldn't let me into them, but I thought it was a brilliant idea for them to do that. But what was cool about these groups was that you had massive support between the students. So as Peter pointed out in his MOOC, the same thing happened in our MOOC. People would raise a question, and it would be answered by a student, usually correctly, usually in under 15 minutes. I thought when this thing started out, if I have 100,000 students and 1% of them write me email, I'm an extremely deep yogurt. So we didn't do that. And luckily, the power of the crowd, the power of the symbiotic combination really worked in our favor. So the other thing we had to, ex uh, we didn't expect that sort of thing. So for example, we had 33% of all of our course completers participated in the forum. That means a third of the students participated substantially in the forum. That's great participation rate, particularly since we know that 7% of them posted uh, substantial uh, amounts of content and answering questions in the forum. So this was particularly interesting because we had this vastly international audience. In our first class, a big chunk, probably around 12% uh, of the class was from Brazil, and we didn't give it in Portuguese. That's an astonishing number. In the second class, we had over half from India. We also built a kind of learning community by offering hangouts on air, and these are sort of narrow cast events. So we would sit up in, you can see this is actually a conference room, this is not a high-tech studio. Uh, so that's Tasha and I answering questions from everybody in the class. I hear you say, that's crazy. Well, we have technology for this. We have a thing called Google Moderator where people can submit their questions and then people vote them up or down. And what's nice about that is that the, the community decides what's important and that cream rises to the top. So out of the several hundred questions that were submitted for the first class, we were able to answer the top 10 or 15. Uh, we also would have a couple special guests. Incredibly interesting way to organize a class, having these hangouts on air. Now, one of the things that's so fascinating is that we had a lot of participation. So in our first class, the first MOOC we did, we had 2.8 million page views. So that's a ton of people. We had uh, uh, a lot of uh, people spending a fair amount of time on the page. It's three and a half minutes because they also would spend a relatively short amount of time on the assignment pages. But when you actually added up all the YouTube video that we served, that's 87,000 hours. 87,000 hours. Remember, 8.7K hours is one year. So that's a decade worth of YouTube video we served up for that first class. As has been mentioned, there's this uh, interesting pattern of attrition. What happens is that people sign up for the class because they're enthusiastic and they think it's fantastic. A class on FUBAR, I'm gonna take that FUBAR class and it'll be fantastic. Well, you know, it's easy to sign up. It's not so easy to come to the first class. So there's this natural drop off that happens between sign up and between first class. And so on this graph, what you can see here is you get this little attrition. It goes down an unpredictable slope. And you also get these beautiful little bumps. 
Those bumps are email reminders that we sent out saying, remember, class two starts today, 3% return, right? I'm going to propose that as an axiom for MOOCs, email reminder return rate. So this is the data for our MOOC. Uh, for this is the first one. We had 154,000 people sign up, 74% uh, attended the first lesson. And I proposed this new uh, idea, the FCCR, the first class to completion ratio, which in our first class was 19%. So that means 19%, one out of five basically people actually got to the first class and completed the entire course. So we had these great scores, like net promoter scores of 4.5, and that's the kind of kind of net promoter score you get for recommendations for things like breathing or conjugal visits. 58% uh, of the survey respondents said they would, uh, uh, re, you know, I'm sorry, 98% would uh, recommend this class to somebody else, and a lot of people loved the fact that they could come in and take it. And we had this phenomenal return. What is it? 40% uh, mean improvement on performance scores. Remember, we were targeting 33%, so total win from on our perspective. Okay. This is the course participation. So each one of those colored bands is the number of posts. So we had hundreds and hundreds of posts per class. These are students helping out. This is the social community of scholars. These are people deeply interested in the topic. We excluded three people at the end of the class for pathological behavior. That's three people out of tens of thousands of students. That's a phenomenal return rate. So here's the couple things you need to think about when you're designing a MOOC, when you're building your own. First, expect to iterate on the design and testing of your course and software. So you knew about the software, think about content as software. You're debugging it internationally, you're debugging it across a broader range of students than you would ever get at a residential university. For example, one of the things we had that I didn't anticipate was we were showing one example of converting rates from tablespoons into cups. And I didn't know that there were imperial tablespoons. And so the answer is different in the UK than here. Who knew? Second thing to count on is that you're going to get a community effect. If your class is at all halfway decent, students will help each other out. Count on that. We could not have done it without that. Because in the first class, we had about a dozen TAs. In our second class, we were able to do that with about four TAs. Think about that. 100,000 students, four TAs. Is that your TA ratio at your university? Okay. Now, our third point is that plan on rewriting and redesigning those assessments and exercises. Uh, this is a big topic of conversation, and our questions really revolve around this. We didn't get it right the first time. We're constantly making these better and better. And in the future of MOOCs, look for this to improve. This is going to be one of those areas that's extremely interesting. Lastly, plan for analytics to track the clicks and views of all this stuff, because you will learn stuff about what your students are learning that you never anticipated. So what we did is we did that class that was so successful, and my boss said, why don't you do it again? And we did it again in October. Uh, we just ran, ran, uh, finished that one up not long ago. And we had a whole ton of people there. And so there you can see the contrast between the first one in, in the light red and the second one. Second class, we had only 127,000 people sign up. But the FCCR, the total fraction of people who completed, was 36%. That's phenomenal return, okay? And all the other metrics went up slightly. Bottom line for me is, I'm teaching people how to be better searchers at a scale that was unimaginable. Unimaginable two years ago, okay? Thank you very much. Thank you, Dad. We have a question here at the Hi, uh, this is Bill Coolis. I'm on the faculty of the School of Library and Information Science at Catholic University. Um, I'd like to sort of bring back the, the question that was came up earlier, which is looking at how this, this massive online phenomenon, shall I say, um, is going to come back and affect the individual universities that you know, I work at and a number of people work at. Um, on a much smaller scale because, well, one, it's personally of interest to how it's going to affect me. But I think it also ties into how, um, how individual universities are going to be able to meaningfully participate in this. You can get MIT, you can get Harvard engaged in these and in investing a lot of money into these tools. 
and you can you can invest a lot of money in building these really nice laboratory virtual laboratories. But there's there, it seems to me that there's a number of you know when you, when you try to look at it and sort of circle back to the to the to the to the smaller scale, what's going to happen there? Where do things go? Is it relevant? I mean, I think it is, but how does all of this play out back in the you know circle back to the to on a smaller scale? Well, I think there's a couple excellent questions buried in there. Um, first, uh, I don't know how it's going to play out in the large. I think it's a fascinating question. What's the, where's the university going to go? But in the small, one thing to note is that the content of my class could have been developed with just two people, you know, a camera person and me, and then using something like the open course uh, open source courseware builder that we have called Course Builder. You can actually just go and, and create your material, wire it in, and that can be small. So I'm going to propose that we have a new kind of MOOC called a SMOOC for a small MOOC. Uh, and that I can imagine making a SMOOC for, you know, a, a class of 30, right? And then you would use it again in the same way that you created slides and you reuse those slides from term to term. Why not have a SMOOC that encompasses that? And you can then use that as an interesting way to aggregate data of your students over time. So even small MOOCs have some particularly interesting potential. I think your larger question um, is a fascinating one. I don't really know the answer. I believe what will happen is that we will see a, a rising of the best in the sense that all of a sudden now, instead of competing with yourself as the only teacher of topic X in your university, you are now going to compete with teachers of Topic X worldwide. I think that can only be. Okay, we have Questions a question from here. Claire, and I'm a sophomore at the business school. I'm here with my honors program, Digital Cultures and Creativity, and we're learning about prototyping and designing with technology. My question is for all the panelists, actually, and it involves how do you design uh, effective courses and effective software that meets the needs of both digital natives, which are usually students, and digital immigrants, which are usually teachers, and what challenges and opposition do you think you will face because of this generational gap? Oh, oh, I, I'm going to question your premise. Uh, 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 you know, it's unclear to me that digital natives exist. Uh, I know there's been a lot of papers about this topic about, you know, they can multitask better. Cliff Nass says they can't, right? Um, it's true. Uh, it's unclear uh, that they can actually manage distractions any better. Uh, and it's unclear to me that they have broader, deeper understanding of software or technology in general. Sure, they know how to power cycle a phone, but that's not the deep understanding of the nature of software. Um, in fact, what seems to be happening with digital natives is that they are extremely skilled in a very narrow set of technology. So, you know, here's a, here's a digital native, expert in Facebook, useless in anything else. Okay, so I'm gonna question the premise, but I, I think your, the gist of your question is, is well placed, which is that there will be very different audiences with different sets of skills. And part of the interesting issue, I think, for us is trying to do this internationally. Because we had a lot of interesting issues, for example, with students from different cultures trying to understand my inflected and idiomatic and unusual phraseology. Uh, and so I have learned to speak more in standard uh, American English and trying to do my best to make that clear in a sort of transnational way. But uh, the gist of your question is right, but I don't think digital natives exist. I wonder if any, Anybody I, else? I wonder if any of our other um, uh, speakers, futurists, would like to uh, take that on. No. <laughs> okay, another question here. I'd like to, if I could just uh, ask any of the futurists to talk a little bit more about the cultural differences that we might see. Uh, we've been talking, we're, we're pretty ethnocentric here in terms of how we think about education. Um, and in those of us who've taught students who have come from other cultures know that there are really differences in the way in which they're respectful to the teacher or the way in which they're, they ask their questions. And I wonder when we go massively online and international, whether we can think about different ways in which 
this would impact our learning. And Nat's nodding his head, so do you want to jump in there? Sure. Uh, sure. I think if you go on to the, uh, you go on to the discussion forum, uh, what was fascinating was that uh, I was on at uh, 2 a.m. one night just watching a discussion go on. By the way, as a professor, this is intoxicating. You sit on your discussion forum and you watch students discussing stuff, and it's just hard to come away. And uh, so at that point, I saw a New Zealander, a Pakistani, I think an Egyptian, a Colombian, uh, a, a student from uh, in California, all discussing and talking to each other. And the amazing thing was that uh, there seemed to be no, uh, no cultural differences. And I think uh, you know, the modern day student, you know, these digitarati, you know, seem to have this common denominator. And, uh, and you know, the, the Facebookization of the world, uh, they all seem to uh, know how to engage in an online discussion forum. Heck, I can't even type fast enough. But, but they all seem to be able to do it and, uh, and engage very meaningfully. Anyone else? Hi, my name is Danette Howard, and uh, I'm the Secretary of Higher Education for the State of Maryland. And I wanted to pose a question to Kevin Carey. And Kevin, earlier you spoke to uh, some of the challenges that we might have in the United States because of the regulatory environment and uh, some of the hurdles that some of our traditional higher education institutions will have to address. Given that, what can those institutions begin to do now so that they aren't left behind as the MOOCs movement progresses? That's a great question, and I think it's one that's probably, if it wasn't on the mind of university leaders before this whole thing happened, I think it definitely is now. Um, and I guess to go back a little bit to what um, I alluded to earlier, the development of colleges and universities in this country has been one, there have been two elements to it. One, it's, uh, institutions have been driven to grow and be all things to all people, to offer whole ranges of degree programs uh, and a whole kind of conglomeration of services. And they've also been driven to try to go up the status ladder, which means you become a, quote, better institution by uh, enrolling students with higher SAT scores. Uh, I think that's caused them, frankly, in many cases, to neglect the opportunities to specialize um, and the need to adapt their educational offerings to students who maybe aren't at the highest level of the SAT range, which who, students who frankly are easier to teach because they come to higher education with more social capital and from a, a, a uh, more social capital and from a, a higher quality K-12 schools. So. I think that this uh, change and this opportunity to reach many, many more students is a, an opportunity for many institutions with a public mission to both uh, re-examine what they're good at, maybe there are certain fields or subjects or approaches to teaching that they are ingrained in their history and their institutional culture, um, and to focus on serving students, not just enrolling students that say something about the institution, but serving students uh, across the entire range of educational need. What, what, we're, the, what institutions are facing in this, is this. Um, the number of possible students they can serve is going to grow by orders of magnitude. At the same time, the economic model that has sustained colleges and universities is going to shift fairly radically. I think it's a race to, to embrace the first opportunity before the risk of the second change catches up with you. Question here. Hello, my name is Dorothy Jones Davis and I'm actually a AAAS fellow at the National Science Foundation. Um, my question is for Dr. Agarwal. I'm interested in um, how we're going to disseminate the information around learning. So we're going to get a lot of information, and I was really impressed that M MIT is going forward and trying to understand the learning environment and um, come up with a series of best practices in some ways. Um, obviously, you've conquered some of these questions around how do we do lab, for example, in the biological sciences and, and chemistry and, and engineering. So uh, what are the... Um, what are the um, things that are going on around disseminating this information, these best practices, especially as more and more institutions hop on the MOOC 
train to, to rush and um, develop new MOOC coursework, I think it's especially uh, useful for the scientific community, for example, to have some information about what are best practices. So is MIT doing anything? And can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, there's a couple of, a couple of ways in which uh, we expect to uh, disseminate the information. And uh, probably both are wrong, uh, but, uh, but I'll, uh, I think the new viral approach of MOOCs just presages a whole new way of doing things. And so maybe we need an online course on best practices. Maybe that's the right way. But, uh, but barring that, one is um, we're gathering a lot of research data. A number of professors are, and education uh, scientists are also working with the data. Um, and uh, a number of papers are being published as we speak but in regular bricks and more, you know, regular conferences. Now, and the second class of experiments uh, is the following. As universities join edX, uh, they, they're called X universities, and they're part of an X consortium. And the idea is that uh, we're, going be, we're going to be creating conferences. Uh, there'll be a conference that will be announced uh, sometime in the spring, open to everybody. And you know, remember, edX is open, it's nonprofit, and it's uh, you know, inclusive for everybody. And hopefully we will have uh, talks and discussions of what we've learned um, that will be open to uh, everybody to uh, participate in. But I think the right answer might be, as you asked the question, is to really create a MOOC course on uh, best practices. And it, it will probably reach 100 times more people than in a 200-person conference. How about hearing from news, the museum, news, museum people? <laughs> Sorry. Question? Yes, greetings. My name is Dave Crusoe, co-founder at Public Learning Media. And so my question is actually for those people who are educators and who have taught classes that are MOOCs. Um, and uh, I think it has relevance to universities looking to teach with MOOCs and through MOOCs. Um, currently, MOOCs are generally opt-in. People are students, particularly, are motivated to take the classes. Um, for those professors who are thinking to make this a mandatory form, what are the implications, the instructional implications in particular, uh, for students who might not normally opt for that kind of a need. I can take that. Uh, I, could, I guess I could uh, try and answer. I, um, I think that uh, I'd go back to something I said earlier. If what you're doing when you're innovating in your course is demonstrating your uh, engagement and, and commitment to new ways for them to learn more, for your students to learn more, uh, it's going to work, and you, you iterate and learn from that, and then you fix what needs to be fixed. Um, if what you're doing is offloading things you don't want to do because it's more convenient for you, <clears throat> chances are your students are not going to respond to that. Uh, so I would say that um, I could see an appeal to saying, you know, going into this lecture hall and dropping in the tape yet again in year 12 uh, on that lecture that I've always done, I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to drop in the tape on camera and make them watch that. I, I could see someone going that route. I, you know, I, I, I think that would be a disaster. So, um, but if what it says is, I'm trying to figure out a new way for you to learn, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move some of the things that I think are better delivered in this format over here, and then you listen and reiterate, I mean, who could not like that? And I think there will be some things that work better this way. Uh, so uh, as long as we're talking how to, how to make the learning environment more vibrant, I think we're fine. If we're talking you know, economies of scale cutting costs, irrespective of learning outcomes, I think students will re rebel. I hope they'll rebel. You know, it, it feels a little bit to me like opting in to use a blackboard. You know, it, it's a piece of instructional technology. A book is a piece of instructional technology. Blackboard, film strips, remember that ding? <laughs> you know, it's exactly the same. Some will work, some will not work. So I don't see it's any fundamentally different. So as uh, many of the edX courses are also taught within universities. So as an example, at uh, San Jose State University in California, you know, one of our courses is being taught on campus. And there, it's not an opt-in. Um, 200 students from across the university take that course. And that course is being taught only on their campus. And uh, they selected half the students at random, and they, and they, and they took this course. It wasn't opt-in. It was, uh, I guess, made to, take, uh, made to take the course. And so initially, I went there and talked to the students. Initially, they felt that uh, it was different. It wasn't opt-in. And uh, there was a lot of trepidation among the students. And uh, there was a lot of uncertainty, trepidation. They were worried. But uh, six weeks, when I spoke to them six weeks into it, 
uh, they really, really liked it once it had gotten past the initial barrier of uncertainty and the newness of the course. And the fact that they could watch the videos at their own pace, at their own time, really helped. And they would come into class. The attendance went through the roof. Uh, the previously, uh, 20, 30 students, 20-30% uh, of them would show up to class. Now, the attendance rates were above 90%. But they would go into class, and the class would be discussion sections where they would talk about problems, and, and, uh, and the professor would answer questions that students had. And so uh, students seemed to be really enjoying it once they'd gotten over the initial barrier. I'd like to uh, stop now at, and, and invite Ira to come back up to the podium. He has the mic right there. We just want to thank you both for coming today, and we also have this. If you're <laughs> I'd like everyone here to thank all of our futurists. And a big round of applause for Ira and, and Allison, who put this together, and our funders. Thank you. And this is Pat O'Shea at the museum. I would like to thank our wonderful hosts here. I'd also like to thank our benefactors at the Robert W. Deutsch Foundation for their generosity and their belief in our vision. <laughs> and I'd like to thank our futurists, Dan Russell, for helping us formulate our vision and for suggesting this program. And Peter, for everything he's done in developing his MOOC. And most importantly, Ira and Allison for making all of this happen. Thank you. So I think that's a wrap, or maybe even a t-shirt. Thank you. Thank you.